How important are the HF digital data modes to a ham radio prepper? In my opinion, it's one of the most important tools in your toolbox. However, there is a problem. It can be overwhelming and really confusing when you start dealing with all the different data modes that are out there. Whether it be you're looking at Winlink, RIDI, Pactor, FSQ, Contestia, Olivia, on and on and on it goes. And you're trying to think, well, which one of those should I focus on and learn? Well, in today's video, what I'm going to try to do is help filter all that out, explain the software that's required to run certain applications, which ones work, which ones are proprietary, and which ones are not. So it'll make it easy for you to understand and narrow down your choice and be able to start enjoying and using the right data modes for a ham radio prepper. If this sounds of interest to you, then let's get started. Hey, this is MJ, call sign KW3KW, and welcome to another episode of Ham Radio Made Simple. Today, I'm continuing on in my series for Ham Radio for Prepping. This is episode number four, and I think these next two episodes, part one and two of HF Digital Modes, are the most important for anyone in Ham Radio trying to get ready for what's coming, for when stuff hits the fan. You really have to understand, because this is going to be the preferred means of communicating, not just listening, I'm talking about communicating with other people around you, and I'll get into all of that today. So, but go ahead and please hit the like button, the subscribe, and add additional comments, uh, insights that you've learned or that you can share with others in the uh, audience who are watching this stuff. This is making a difference. More people are finding it, and we're reaching more people to get them ready. So thank you. I appreciate that. So today's agenda, what is HF Digital? Why is it important? Why you should use it? What are the four digital modes that I'm going to talk about that you need to understand and learn? Um, I'm going to go over the three software apps that these work off of. I'm going to talk the difference between an internal versus an external sound card. It's no different than when I talked about the NFED half-wave antenna, the difference between resident and non-resident. This is kind of the same thing. This is how your setup is going to be determined. And you have to know that if you have an internal sound card, you go A. If you have an external sound card, you have to go route B. Totally different ways you do the setups and equipment required to do it. Uh, I'll also talk about rig software that is required when you have an external sound card and get into summary. I'm going to go ahead and share the agenda with part two. That's going to be more hands-on, less video uh, of, of me on um, PowerPoint. It's going to be more of just turning on the screen capture and watching me go through the software programs in itself. I'm going to do device manager uh, setup and software. I'm going to show you some things that were, I got tripped up because uh, there's a little trick you need to do under the view section of your device manager in order to find your hidden ports. I'm going to get into all of that. Make it easy for you. Um, and, and go again, shortening the learning curve for you and making sure that you can learn this 10 times faster than I've had to. I'll go over the rig software, and especially for external uh, sound cards. I'll do the software setup in the four modes, and it's going to be in two sections. It's going to be without a serial port setting that up and uh, with a serial port or the sound card, internal sound card put in. So you'll see the differences between the two, and I'll get into a summary on that. But let's make the assumption we're not going to start from zero and go to Mad Max overnight. I still believe that there's going to be, uh, you know, I call it a progression over a period of time. What is that period of time? I don't know. Is it months or is it a couple years? Who knows? But we'll go from rolling blackouts to no internet, cell, and regional. But just the same way, I'm going to prepare everyone to say, okay, let's assume the worst that we have uh, no cell towers, nothing working. What do we want to what do we want to use to get set up to do all of this? And I'll get into that. If you're looking for how to do this for CQ, contesting, communicate, you know, uh, with people outside of when stuff hits the fan, this will still have some value for you, but you're not the primary audience. I want the people that are looking to be able to say, okay, I have, uh, you know, I, I, what's the best way to communicate digitally? Or actually, what's the best way to communicate at all with my ham radio when stuff hits the fan? So... I'm not going to cover proprietary software. There's great companies out there like Ham Radio Deluxe, but it's 100 bucks a month, for example, I think it is, plus a yearly maintenance fee on that. I'm going to use open source uh, free software that most of us are using today. I'm assuming that it's Windows 10 on a PC or laptop, but a lot of this information, if you have a Linux or if you have a Raspberry Pi, um, it's probably some tweaks you can figure out on your own or for some other videos, but it's still going to be very beneficial for you. 
So what surprised me is that I didn't realize that back in the 1940s, digital actually was being used. So it's been around for quite a while, though. And so what is it? You're basically taking digital data transmitted via your computer through your transceiver, through your antenna, over to someone else's antenna, through their transceiver to their computer. And this is often known, you're going to hear things known as keyboard to keyboard. So from my keyboard on my computer to someone else's keyboard via the communicating back and forth from our ham radio HF devices. So a sound card is going to be required. Now, you can have one internally or it can be external. And again, I'll talk more about that in a second. But a sound card is a must in order to set this thing up. If you can just picture yourself on your cell phone texting or doing messaging or using an app like Telegram even on your on your PC, um, that's basically what this is. You're doing texting, messaging, and email. But you can also attach files, forms, and pictures. So kind of blew my mind. I didn't think you can do it. Is it as fast? Not necessarily. But... Can you actually communicate with somebody when there is no internet and there's no cell phone towers and you both have, um, you know, your HF system set up and you're doing digital? The answer is absolutely yes. Very cool. Let me tell you something here. This is going to take an average setup like mine, my ICOM 7300 with a, you know, uh, my MCOM 2 uh, NFED half wave antenna that's out there, which is really cool. I like it. You know, I can do voice. I'm, I'm very limited of what I can do on voice as far as distance and stuff. And the skip zones just play a number on me. I can't reach people in between my skip zones. Well, that can take that average setup and it makes it better. So now I, I'm able to have a larger cover area. And I'm not, you know, talking just, just distance. I'm talking coverage area. It's, you know, picture like the old Verizon and AT&T maps that show you where all the cell towers are. Instead of seeing all these you know, empty spaces in there, it starts to fill in. This is what the HF digital modes do for us ham radio people that are trying to communicate. I'm telling you, it is the way to go when stuff hits the fan. So I can do local, regional, I can do long distance with it. Uh, I, can, I call it, I fill in the coverage gaps that my uh, radio today, which has a lot of coverage gaps of trying to communicate. I can do HF digital with somebody 30 miles away from me and 300 miles away from me and 3,000 miles away from me that I could you know, barely reach or not even hit any of those because of propagation conditions and skip zones. You know, And again, propagation still play a role in HF too, but the impact of the voice is dramatic. The cool thing about the HF uh, digital modes is I can use weaker signals and they will often work. So instead of trying to you know crank it out at 85 to 100 watts to get a voice that may or may not be heard on that, I can do 20 watts or less even. And I may have to go up to maybe 35 watts. But what you're trying to do on it is the goal is lower power because what you want to do is save your batteries. Because remember, if there's no power on there, like I use solar, I can do solar backup, get my batteries charged, and I can use my battery backup system and use the lower power, and it's going to go all day long. So I essentially what you want to do is be able to leave it on in the, in the receiving mode. Now think about it if you're doing voice. If you're doing voice, you have to be sitting by your uh, PC, not, you know, not just your PC, but your rig, all day long waiting to hear a transmission to come in. With this, if someone leaves a message, it's in my pop-up window. I come back, oh, someone left me a message, and I can, re I can respond to it. And so, again, when you're in the receive mode, you're using, you know, very little ambage compared to when you're driving it, the power through when you're doing a transmission. But again, lower watts, 20 watts versus 85 watts. So I like it. Others are liking it because it's more reliable than voice. Uh, you know, hit or miss. And a lot of times I'd say more miss than for people I'm directly trying to communicate with, directly. It's not the same that I can go out there and, oh, today I can get, you know, you know, parts of Florida and parts of Texas and, and stuff. This is where on a consistent basis I want to reach my son-in-law over in Johnson City, Tennessee. Or I want to reach Steve, who's actually, you know, maybe 15 miles away in Youngsville, KE2KN. I can reach them with digital. It's really cool. So I call it the skip zone equalizer. It basically can fill in where the skip zone says no to voice. Uh, listen, it's not encrypted, it's not the most secure, but it's a lot better than public as voice is because when this is being transmitted, unless someone is actually on looking at a particular uh, mode, so you know, FSQ at, at 4.125 uh, at a particular time, you know, most likely they're not, there's less people at it. So is it totally secure? No. Is it more secure than voice? Absolutely, yes, it is. 
And again, watch my last video on near vertical incident sky wave antenna. That's a tool that goes along with this. So on the 40 and 80 meters, again, the, the skip zone equalizer doing with the uh, HF digital is outstanding. It's just outstanding. You really need to focus on that. So when you're doing HF, you need to understand that you need to have a plan. So essentially think of it as uh, here's a, during these time periods, uh, mode and frequency that, you know, KE2KN or WO0BAM uh, in Johnson City, those which ones I'm trying to reach, if they know to look at certain times and look for mode and frequency and to see if my messages are coming through, but also have a backup because those may either be busy or could be bad propagation and I could have a different one. I could do a different time, different mode, and different frequency if they're not receiving it. So always have contingencies and backs up. But you can see for those who are, you know, putting in comments in there that, hey, listen, I don't need my license. Uh, when it happens, I'm all set and I'm ready to go. Well, I doubt it because if you have not tested, practice, and com practice communicating with others who you're trying to do at what frequencies, at what modes, what time of day, what works with your antenna setup, et cetera, good luck. There's no learning curve time at that point. So practice and test now while we still have the opportunity and while the electricity is on and you're not burning through your batteries trying to figure this thing out. So who uses it today? And this really shocked me. Not that emergency communication groups such as Aries and Racy's, for example, that use it, uh, but the fact that they use this more than voice, that they use this to send their, their, their completed forms and, and files and stuff that go back and forth. This basically the preferred method of communications is the HF digital mode for emergency situations that are out there today. So if they're using it and they see it as probably one of the most valuable tools for ham radio, why should you and I not use that services? It's already been proven and reliable. So ham radio clubs are now starting to get into it and because they, they actually help at the county level that are doing it, but are starting to understand the digital uh, uh, HF modes and which ones are working. So ham radio, ham radio operators today have been using it, you know, and again, the explosion, I think, since about 2015. Again, don't quote me on that, but just from the number of increase in modes and videos that came out since then, um, it seems like it really has taken off. But the reason they're doing it, it can take your, your equipment in mind, which is, I call it, not the most ideal. Yeah, I have an ICOM 7300, and I have uh, an MCOM uh, 2 uh, antenna. And even have a vertical antenna, Comet CH250 antenna that's out there. But I still have a lot of gaps and, and issues trying to reach people that I'm, you know, trying to get in particular. This basically takes that and makes it like it's something new. So I could kind of equate it as this is me doing voice today and this is me doing digital today. It's like a difference between this and this. You know, yeah, the old tube system worked and they, you can do it. But when all of a sudden with these newer radios with the, you know, the band filters and uh, all the higher filtrations and, and the electronics that go into it, it's like, wow, what a big difference. Well, that quantum jump that you can think of just on the voice, I would say, is equal, if not more, when you go to digital and what you're going to get in as through is output. So to me, Prepper's best tool in the toolbox. Uh, again, explosive and growth. It's constantly improving. There's new modes and uh, that are coming out. So keep looking at this stuff, practicing, and find out what works best. The list of digital modes that, you know, I'm going to recommend, and again, it's not, a, you know, this is what I'm going to say of my time. Here are four that you need to know. You need to know JSA Call, Olivia Contestia. They're basically built off the same platform, and I'll explain a little bit more about each here in another slide or two. FSQ and Windlink. You know, make sure you know how to use at least two of these four. And if there's other ones that someone's using PSK31 that's out there, they like it, put it in the comments below, explain why and what's the upside, the benefits from it. Greatly want to hear about that. But here's at least four that you need to know to start with. Uh, and there's, again, there's too many to list. These are my preference uh, as a prepper. And again, not limited to this list, but again, start with these. Now, be aware that on certain uh, data modes, it requires time synchronization. And that means that both the, the sender and receiver have to be within one second or less or within two seconds or less, depending on the mode that you get into. And this is where computer software, you know, ICOM has it. There's other ones that are out there that can do, um, uh, I call it atomic time, on your computer via the internet and push it over to your rig and making sure that you're constantly, everyone's being synced because it's not all, 
But on some of these data modes, it does require synchronization and they have to be exact. That goes in there. So what happens if you don't have the internet and you need, that software is no longer working? Well, you can actually buy an atomic clock such as this for about 30 bucks on Amazon. And it's going to get uh, use a radio frequencies broadcast from the uh, NIST's Colorado location and can automatically set the time to the, you know, the exact second. Option number one, but if they get nuked or eventually if their satellites go down or whatever and you can't get the signal, then, um, you know, there are other ways to do it. But that's why you have to have software that is not necessarily predicated on time synchronization. But JSA call is required, but it also has a built-in tool I'll explain a little bit later. Now, digital software, uh, this is uh, FL Digi. This is where Libya, Contessia, FSQ, I'm talking about, will operate, but a lot more uh, modes operate off of this one I'll show you here. This is what JSA call looks like. You know, you've got a, like an inbox. You've got, you know, um, uh, receive box, inbox, receive box. Here's over here is the different people that are reaching out that you can look at their call signs and you can get information on them and actually click on someone here to respond back to. So again, not to go into a, a how to use JSA call today, just be aware JSA call is a, is a very popular tool that is out there as well as FL Digi. And uh, the other one I really like is WinLink or WinLink Express that's going to be used in it. And essentially think of this as a uh, email. This is ham radio email, that what you're trying to do. So required software. Well, the ones that I picked are free and open source, and I'll have the links listed uh, below. Uh, so make sure that you look for that. Um, like free is good. Make sure you're always doing uh, the updates or the upgrades on the software. And if you notice that some of these videos in there, they're going to be, you're going to see a screen on it that looks so old that doesn't look anything like your current version that's out there today. Uh, again, you're going to see how much changes and upgrades and improvements they keep making to the system. Again, each one is rig specific. So when I'm using any of these, it's specific to one rig. It's, it's, it takes configuring uh, specifically to your rig and your setup. Again, settings are going to vary in some of this. I'll, I'll be able to help you with probably about 90% of it, 10%. You may have to you know, dig around on the internet or just use some common sense and logic. Now, uh, what I'm going to show you uh, a little bit today on the, on, the, on the hardware side, but in the next video is uh, the ICOM 7300 with an internal sound card and the ASU FT891 with an external sound card. And I'll walk you through the setups, both of those, and how to use it. So we talk about WinLink Express. This is really growing. People are using it today to basically do radio email. And it does require an internet gateway and Amazon Web Services hosting. It all goes through. So if, you know, the grid goes down, it may go down. If it's regional, you still might be able to use it. So, for example, if uh, my internet is down here but it's not down in, let's say, Florida, I could probably reach a, a Florida uh, gateway server and send an email to somebody as long as they have internet service. But again, I wouldn't put too much into this. What you need to focus on is, is the WinLink peer-to-peer. -peer. And this is when the grid goes down. You're not relying on the uh, um, internet whatsoever in here. So this is where you can leave it on because it's not pulling you know, uh, much power. Um, you can find messages. You can go back, check for messages. It'll download any of the messages that have been sent. A great tool. You don't have to be sitting by your computer uh, and your rig waiting for a voice communication to come in or may not come in. You walk away, come back, check for your messages. It's great. One of the things that you're going to find though with Lendlink Express is think of it as like it's your operating system. So it's Windows. But within Windows, you have a search engine. I could use, you know, uh, Google, Yahoo, Brave, uh, you know, name your, your search engine that you want. So when we talk about open sessions that you have up in here, uh, so think of this as your, your basic software operating tool, and then what service do I want to use to actually do the communication in? So we're going to want to be able to use the Vera H, you know, HF peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. And this is nice because you can work with weak signals. So I don't need the strongest signals. And again, voice is really hard doing weak signals. You're increasing your power. You're having to, uh, sometimes you're going to lose and miss the weak signals. HF works great with weak signals. They also have a military upgrade option uh, for the VARA, which I went through and paid about 70 bucks, I think, for. I'm not sure what it is today, but it is faster. There's less errors, and it works great. But people out there have been using it for a while. Use what is known as AirDop or Pactor. These are other choices in here. 
pack their peer-to-peer or air dot peer-to-peer. They've been out a while. Uh, again, VAR is the newer version, the newer fixes, so the latest and greatest. Uh, some people prefer they, they get better results with maybe Pactor. So again, not absolute hard and stone. VAR is the way to go. Try it. Again, this is where you need to practice and test. We talk about JSA call. This whole system was built upon the FT4, the FT8, which is a very weak signal propagation, which does require a, a time sync. But it's, it's low power mode. And uh, major organizations in the ham radio community and the prepping community, such as uh, Amron, uh, uses JSA call, as well as other groups that are out there. So time sync is important. But essentially allows you to do free texting. So where, where the FT8 was basically, here's five commands, my signal report, grid location, call sign, et cetera, et cetera. It got sent off, went back to somebody else. They picked it up. And some people really like doing that. You're not doing keyboard to keyboard chat. But on that same platform that does weak signal, they're able to now incorporate texting. And, you know, so I can do free text, keyboard to keyboard off of it. And there's a lot of people that use it out there. Um, there's four different texting speeds. Um, and again, as you notice over here, and I'll actually just show you right now, slow, normal, fast, and turbo. And it's predicated uh, basically on um, the, your uh, signal to noise ratio. So when I have a, you know, here it is, this is a high, minus 28 to, you know, dB, uh, this is not really good. Uh, it's, 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 so it's going to require me to go slow. But if I had a faster, um, basically, dB, 20 uh, noise to, to uh, uh, sound ratio, um, if I had a minus 20, I can go faster. So why, what does that mean? So if I'm doing, having to use slow to make sure that I'm not getting a lot of errors, it's, it's coming across correctly, it's not getting funky characters or missing them or skipping them or whatever, uh, slow requires me to do eight words per minute. Whereas, you know, fast is 24 words per minute. And you can see there's a big difference. It's three times as fast in here. So this is going to determine basically your speed. But remember this, always slow, at least you get it correctly <laughs> versus if you try to go fast and you're not getting all of it, what good is it? So you can start slow and then eventually increase the speed based on what you're finding your noise, uh, sound to noise ratio is, as well as what you're getting success in your communications back and forth with somebody else. It's not uncommon to start out slow and kick it up to normal or fast after a couple uh, conversations. And this is where you find all of this is under the mode and allows you to pick the different ones. And again, this is not a time to show you how to do this, but I'm trying to point out in all of these modes, you're going to find the, the speed is associated with the signal to noise ratio. It's associated with errors uh, or correct <laughs> lack of errors and the words per minute that's coming across. That's a key concept to, to walk away with from this slide. So when we look at JSA call in here, uh, it does have a way, if you don't have an atomic clock, to do what is known as uh, showtime drift controls. So let's say we have three people on here and we're all synced at different times. Well, it's not going to work. But if we allow the first person to say, okay, they're going to be the master of the authoritative time, there is, and again, not going to show you how to do it today, but there is a way by hitting that and going down in, in this tool in here is to select that person and, and we're going to all sync off of their time. So it does have a workaround without using the atomic clock. But again, it is a negative. So time synchronization is definitely required in plus or minus two seconds on this particular app. Uh, again, it's going to have a message box. Uh, you're going to be able to send with the right mouse click. We'll get into all this showing it. You can do direct message to message on this one. You can relay messages. So if, if there's three people in a group and uh, uh, A can reach B, but B can't reach uh, C, you can actually go, A can go through C to get to B or vice versa. But bottom line is, if you have a group of people, you can relay messages from those who you who you can reach, but they can't reach somebody else. You can actually send it, um, or excuse me, you can't reach from A to C, but you can reach B. A can go to B and B can go to C. So again, it's a way of relaying messages when you can't get to it. So if I was basically, bottom line, think of it this way. I'm in North Carolina here and I'm trying to get to uh, state of Washington. And I can go as far as maybe, uh, let's say, Nebraska. I can pick up somebody in Nebraska. Now, now, Nebraska can pick up somebody in Washington. I can send my message to that person uh, in Nebraska, and it can automatically be sent. If we're connected, all, all of us are connected, it can go through that person in Nebraska all the way up to Washington. That's the beauty of it. It's taking a weaker system and making it work better. So you got to acknowledge pop-ups. So when, I, when we're talking again about the signal-to-noise ratio, 
here. This is a weaker signal. The, you know, minus 28, minus 24 is weak, minus 28 is weaker. Minus 18 is a stronger signal than minus 28. And you're going to find these in certain uh, reports that are out there. So, for example, if I'm looking at this particular frequency, minus 7, uh, I may be able to hit the fast and turbo speeds, be able to go in. Versus the minus 24, I want to probably do the slower normal speed in here. So this is something you need to pay attention to. And in some of the software applications, it'll actually show you the uh, signal-to-noise ratio of the transmission and the reception. So this is just a quick, uh, I call it, look at the GUI of the FL Digi software that's out there. That's where your frequency is. And this is connected either directly uh, to an internal sound card or through a rig control application to an external sound card. You know, when, just so that you know, the importance of some of this stuff is if, if I'm trying to connect to uh, KE2KN and uh, Steve and we're using this particular frequency, if, if he's transmitting down at around the 1,000, I have to be down here. I have to move this down, drag this down over so that we're operating in the same range. So there is some understanding of where is the center part of your frequency that you're using uh, within it. And it's also, you can see some of these numbers uh, down here at the bottom, um, right in here, the 1500, I can change it. But again, that's the next uh, video. Uh, squelch, uh, really weak signals, turn it off. If it's a fairly decent signal, turn it on. And this is your slider. It goes up and down. It's always you want some distance between the green and the uh, slider that goes up and down. Uh, some people swear they, they'll never turn it on. Some people swear they never turn it off. I found that, that if it's a very, very weak signal, if you turn the squelch off, you're going to start to pick up more stuff. So we look at Olivia Contestia. They're basically, Contestia is built off of Olivia, okay? And it comes from the family of the MFS, MFSK modes that are in here. So they share the same frequencies. Contesti is, again, based off of Olivia, but it is faster, but there's a price. It doesn't support the upper and lower extended characters. So bottom line, if you're going to get something slightly less uh, robust in copying ability with, uh, with, within the poor band uh, conditions, but it's going to go faster. So again, both of them have its pluses and minuses. You got to decide which ones work at which times you want to use. And so if I'm in the FL Digi, if I go under op mode, look at all these different ones that are in here. Here's the FSQ, here's Contestia, here's Domino, uh, PSK. And within each of these, these are the speed levels that I can go in the transmission. So this is slower and this is going to go to fast. So poor conditions go slow, good conditions go medium, great conditions, you can go fast. And this is, again, what this relates is in words per minute and error correction. So think of it this way. Now, on the FSQ data modes, and again, here I'd be just selecting that on the op modes, just pull that down. And typically, you know, you might want to start at uh, 2, but just for this video or for this presentation, I'm doing a 4.5 just to show you here. It's older, uh, no time sync required. Olivia, uh, Contestia, no time sync required either. Either. Um, again, both of these can do direct keyboard to keyboard messaging. You can relay messages. You can have three users on. A can't reach C, but B uh but B can't reach both, so you can actually work through it where A relays to B, who can relay to C. So again, relaying information is a great extra tool in here. The nice thing is you can send files and forms easily right from your computer. So I can do a file transfer from my computer to another computer. And again, why is this important in here? Again, sending files and, and forms is important. Uh, but one of the things I find is when you send a file or form, unless somebody really is knows exactly what you're doing, where you're doing it, it's harder for them to be able to pull it up and, and, and look at it. So if you're talking about a sense of privacy or higher level of security, better way of doing things. Voices, there is none, unless you're trying to talk coded or a language no one else understands. So again, my file directly within FSQ, I can send right to Steve and Steve can send a reply back right to that file that's sitting in my FSQ directory. It's pretty cool stuff. You'll see a lot of this stuff in the next video. So where are the frequencies that you use for this stuff? I'm telling you what, it's, it's, there is no one site you go to. There is some that have maybe about 80% of the data, but they miss others. So I'm trying to build a list to find out what are the frequencies, and more importantly, what are the frequencies that are more common so I can practice on. And this is my list that I've created here over the right on here. But uh, understand that there is a dial frequency, and there's also something known as a center frequency. And so you don't want to put the center frequency in the dial frequency. Um, also, if you, when we're looking at some of these frequencies here, um, we have right in here uh, the 1500 
again, if down over here is where maybe Steve is transmitting, I have to make sure we're both at that same frequency in here. We, I can't be sitting here and trying to talk Steve who's sitting over here. We have to be lined up. And it's going to show me where I'm at. And I'll get into exactly how you can move and change all this stuff. Band plans. Okay. Um, bandplans.com is a great way to start to build your list. And for example, here's Olivia. And I can actually, within Olivia, pull it up. And I can look at the 20 meter, all the different frequencies for the 20 meter. I can look, you know, bring it over. I can do the 80 meter, 70 meter, or excuse me, 75 meter. So uh, this is a great source to begin with on there, but also make sure that you're understanding, for example, like on FSQ that I found in here, um, that I'm not using uh, the incorrect region. Make sure the region that you're in, obviously I'm not in region three in here, so I don't want to be using it. So it could be region two, you could be in region one. Make sure you're using the right region. Uh, so what is the required hardware for all of this stuff? Um, obviously you're gonna have to have your transceiver, but you have to determine is your sound card is it going to be, you know, internal or external? So if we're looking at it, whereas, for example, on the FT-891, there's no internal sound card, but there is a data jack. So I have, I want to hook this up to my computer, and I'm going to do it from my, you can either do a laptop, a tablet, a Pi device. You can just operate on Windows, Android, Linux. A lot of these applications will, but I'm going to focus on Windows and on the PC in here. But cables are going to be different for everyone's setup. So I can't say this is one cable that can be used universally. They're all specific to both your computer. Do you have a USB-A or a USB-C port? Do you have um, a 6-pin? Do you have an 8-pin on your uh, data jacks uh, based on your manufacturer? Is, do you have a mic jack that goes with it? Again, very complex, but I'll try to show you just simply how I've been able to put this together here. I, I use mine through a company called DigiRig, digirig.com. Um, they have a great product. And so I can take, uh, f and I'll show you that in just a second here on the FT891. But if I have an internal sound card, it's plug and play. All I simply need is a shielded. You don't want to have a non-shielded uh, uh, printer cable, basically, USB-A to USB-B shielded cable. You want a printer cable, shield it. Typically, this is what you're going to see right in here. It goes right in the back. My ICOM 7300 goes over into my PC, and I'm connected. Simple as that. Now, when you have to get into um, external sound cards, you can buy a device such as a Signal Link for about $135. It's been out for years. The model is going to be based on the pin connector that's associated with your rig in the back. So, again, pay attention to that. Um, and essentially, it's going to be two cables that you're going to use, the USB jack and the RIDI table. Uh, the RIDI data jack. So these are the cables that are essentially going for your external sound cards. Another one is a DigiRig. And uh, this is the device I use. And you only need one. But so you can see there's a USB side on one side and there's an audio serial on the other. You just need the audio. So it's simply basically doing the USB shielded cable, 10 bucks, connected from the back of my uh, Yaesu FT891. And it's going to go into my computer. And then I'm going to take... Now... The reason I'm showing you two cables is when you buy from DigiRig, they send you two, but only one of them is correct. And the reason they package two is because they sell other F Yaesu devices that do require the two, but the FT891 only requires one of the two cables. They're both not the same. It's the six-pin one that you want to look at. So I only need one of these, the six-pin one. And I take the audio pin, goes into the audio, and I take the uh, uh, six-pin, and I take that, goes into my data, uh, data uh, jack. Then a simple USB-C to USB whatever, could be USB-C to USB-A or USB-C to USB-C, typically about seven buck connector, and I'm all set up. So it's going to cost me about 80 bucks for this type of unit. This is a really, this little box here is probably, I don't know, a one and a half by uh, one inches or two inches by, you know, one inch. It's not big at all, very small, and it's an excellent design. So 80 bucks plus the cables. Now, external sound card, uh, again, looking at this in a different way, is this is how my system looks like hooked up. Here's my digital uh, digibox. Here is my USB-C to USB-A, which goes to my computer. And this is my six pin that's going to go over. So again, I hook up my printer cable. I then hook up my DigiRig uh, two cables that I need to put in. The audio, again, audio in port goes in here. Six pin goes over here. And USB-C 
to uh, USB A goes over. Essentially, that's it. That's all I need. So hopefully that makes sense to you in there. So uh, when there's no internal sound card, you're going to have to have rig software. And this is FL rig. And again, I'll walk you through all of this in there. But this is what it requires. You turn this on first before you, you turn on your other software applications. You got to get the rig control first. So uh, in here, it's basically, it's, this is real simple to set up. It's config. You do set up transceiver. And from the transceiver menu, you're going to drop down. You need to put in your rig, uh, your COM port, and your baud rate, which is set, like on my FT, uh, FT891, it's set at 19.2 on the setup. So this has to be 19.2 for my rig control software. And again, go into all that next week. All I have to do is hit the initialize. Let's go around in here and off we go. Again, I'll walk you through all of this next week. Software operations. So you're gonna need to download rig software from your manufacturer's website. So there's firmware updates that you're gonna need to do. Make sure that your software is updated by on the firmware. And then there's USB connection type. So for example, if we look at uh, Yesu, uh, what I'm going to do on my FT891, I need to download the USB drivers and install them. And I have need to then to lo line it up with Device Manager and recognize what it is. So under Files in here, it's the AC, again, make sure you see, it's this folder, Files. And down over here on the bottom is the FT891 USB driver virtual com port. I have to install this before I do anything. This is step one before I even installed the rig software. So you have to do this. And if I'm looking at the ICOM, 70, uh, ICOM uh, 7300, again, got to do the same thing. Um, here on, on it, the USB driver for the 7300, it shows the 7300 right in here. Here's the manual uh, download page. I can go in there and it's going to either let you know 32 or 64 bit. I have a 64 bit. And that's where I need to go. I install this and I hit the device manager uh, once that's done and recognize and see if I can find it. Now, as we wind up here, and again, I'll go more into this next week, take you step by step to walk you through all of this. This is again the introduction. Be wise with your power. You don't want to be doing medium and high power. So low power is the goal. That's why you want to do HF digital. Keep it low. Keep it around 20 watts or lower if you can. If you have to go up, fine. But to, you know, start out at 15 or whatever and because you want to prolong your battery use. Make sure you have a good antenna because I'm telling you, you know, the antenna is probably the most important tool that is in your, your whole setup. If you don't have a good antenna, and you, you can have high-end equipment, have a crappy antenna, you got a crappy system. You can have a low-end system with a great antenna, and you're going to have a decent system. So antenna is where you need to focus on. You know, 20 to 35 wa uh, watts, you know, that's a lot. If you can do less, it's better. But, you know, figure that you may end up doing having to do that, depending upon, again, your location, topography, what obstacles you're running into, who you're trying to reach, what their location is, etc. So in summary, I truly believe that the uh, digital modes are the best way to communicate when, you know, stuff hits the fan. And even now, even without it, I can reach people that I can't because my voice just doesn't work. It just doesn't reach them and their voice doesn't reach me, but I can reach them from a digital uh, one of these digital modes. So to me, I love digital. Uh, it offers lower power, weaker signals, uh, broader area of coverage, reaches where voice can or will not. Uh, top digital modes, this is my list. It's not necessarily going to be your list, but FSQ, and again, no particular order, FSQ, Olivia Contestia, JSA Call, WinLink, uh, Vara. Um, could be PSK31, whatever, whatever modes that you're using. Love to hear comments. Someone using a different digital mode. Why do you like it? What's the advantage of it? Uh, so again, the software that I'm showing you is free. It's open source. It's constantly being updated. And uh, it's something that uh, what I do is I back it up on two different devices uh, so that if my one laptop goes down, I already have another laptop set up with everything included, all of the settings, everything ready to go to plug and play. Again, backup is great. Hardware, internal sound card is simple. It's a basically, you know, a printer cable uh, going from the rig to your, to your laptop. Um, external sound card, it could be the signal link, could be DigiRig, which I prefer the DigiRig based on the cost. It's light, it's easy to use. Um, and I can use that DigiRig, you know, with, with multiple other devices outside of uh, my, just my FT891. So it's a great investment. Um, 
Always make sure you update your firmware and the USB driver software is always updated too because that's going to be critical going forward. And again, back all this up, save it, have it more than one place. So my next video, and I'm going to get into, again, I talked about device manager setup. Uh, we're going to do the software setup. We're going to do the rig control software setup. We're going to go over internal and external sound cards and uh, tips and tricks in using the software, which is going to be important. So hopefully this is enough information at least to get you started and get you ready to go on to actually, you know, setting all of this up. And you can understand it's not as hard as you think. And by me helping you and walking you through step by step, you should be able to do this. Again, I've had to piece together multiple videos and ask people and hopefully I can take all that information and put it into one location for you guys all to get up and running and use H, uh, the HF digital modes quickly and successfully. So I appreciate you guys listening to me. Again, this is MJ kw 3 kw And if you like, please hit the like and the subscribe. And I appreciate the great comments below. Again, not for my benefit, for others to find it that they can learn like you are learning. And this is, again, MJ with Ham Radio Made Simple, out.